Hello and welcome to the Links Distinguished Speaker Series. My name is Norani Nimpuno and I'm the Head of Global Engagement here at Links and I'll be moderating today's session. So welcome to all of you who are participating live in this webinar. It's fantastic to see so many people calling in from different parts of the world. Uh, and welcome to all of you who are watching it on YouTube as well, of course. For those of you who are participating live, do feel free to use the chat to chat amongst yourselves, but also use the Q&A to ask questions to the speaker and I'll make sure to bring them to Philip at the end. So the Lynx Distinguished Speaker Series is a series of talks gathered here at Lynx by experts in the industry who have deep knowledge and expertise and often a unique perspective on a particular subject. And it is my great pleasure today to welcome the speaker of today, Philip Smith. Philip Smith, I know is a familiar face and name to many of you in the community. Philip Smith has been working in the internet industry since the early 1990s after catching the internet bug in the mid 1980s while at university. He previously worked at APNIC as learning and development director where his team's responsibilities range from training, APNIC conferences and events network operation group support, technical programs such as IPv6 deployment, internet exchange points and root name server deployment, and the Information Society Innovation Fund grants program. Before APNIC, he was a member of the Internet Infrastructure Group in CTO Consulting Engineering of Eng Cisco Systems for more than 13 years. He's also served for three years on the Board of Trustees on the Internet Society. Prior to working to Cisco, he spent five years at Pipex, incorporated into UUNet, and now part of Verizon's global ISP business, the UK's first commercial ISP, where he was head of network engineering. As I said, I know he's a familiar face to many of you. He's done lots of interesting technical talks around the world on internet related topics, and he's done a lot of capacity building workshops specifically in, in the Asia Pacific region. So without further ado, I will hand over to Philip and Philip, the floor is yours. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, and well, <laughs> wherever you are participating in this um, um, webinar. Um, so Narani asked me if I would uh, be interested to uh, contribute to uh, this series. And um, we were talking about, well, just some of the work that I was um, undertaking um, at the time, and I hope this is working. Come on. I hope that's working. That looks like it's worked. Um, so we're looking at, at, at some of the um, work that I was doing at the time. This was a few months ago, probably when we're in the middle of the whole COVID panic, uh, uh, pandemic panic. And I don't know, I was, I was expecting it to be some kind of uh, you know, something to do with BGP, which is something I seem to have been doing half my life. But then I was mentioning, well, you know, I'm helping um, this specific island rebuild the internet service provider. And so, well, here we are. And so I've start, I started uh, putting together some of the little um, challenges and interesting things and in doing all this presentation. And it's ended up being far too big because there's just so many stories. So I'll try and share what I can in the, in the time that I have to let you just see some of the things that we've, we've had to do. Um, and so this was really rebuilding their uh, network infrastructure. Um, there's a long history of involvement, which I'll cover in a little a while. But first, I want to just acknowledge that um, Rue Garoa and the SENPAC team um, well, really gave me permission to share the story. It is quite an interesting story. Um, also, thanks to the Network Startup Resource Center for a lot of encouragement and inspiration in doing uh, some of the work here too. So the first question is, well, Nauru. Um, I mean, the folks um, in the Asia and Pacific region probably have heard of Nauru. A lot of us in the Pacific know where it is. And well, this is Nauru. Um, it's Pacific Island. Uh, sitting on the equator, north of Brisbane-ish, but where exactly? Um, it's there. So I've pointed out Brisbane in the bottom left of the screen, a direct line, it's about three and a half thousand kilometers. So it's about the same distance, at least for folks in Europe, from London to Cairo, or about this distance from Los Angeles to Chicago or thereabouts in, in the US. So it's, 
even though it looks kind of small there, it's actually a very, very long way. Um, flying time, I believe, is about five and a half, six hours nonstop from Brisbane. Um, so you can see various other um, Pacific nations round about, you know, Fiji there um, in, the, in the bottom center, Vanuatu, Solomons, New Caledonia, and so forth. All very interesting and beautiful places. What about Nauru? Well, I was there in 2012, and these are some of the photos I took then. Um, so kind of a little bit different. There's a lot of limestone. Um, and you see some of the columns there. Um, so the top pictures, you know, around the beach. Uh, the top right is, uh, you know, a beautiful lake on the north side of the island. Bottom left is a beautiful lake in the center southwest. But then there's also the uh, phosphate industry. And the phosphate industry has caused the almost moonscape uh, devastation that you see in the center panorama that I've got there. All this has been mined and it's just wild um, vegetation that has regrown. And so, and just a few other pictures, that old um, American car abandoned in the garage there. It was so sad driving past that and seeing it sitting there. Anyways, enough of the pictures for now. Um, what's the history of all this? Why am I even involved in, in doing all this? Um, so quickly through the history. So Senpak came to Paknog 6 in Fiji. That was back in November 2009 at the Tanoa Hotel in Nandi. And Ru was in a bit of strife because the lead technician, well, the only technician for the ISP, Senpak, had died. Um, the only other personnel were administrative. And Senpak was running the .nr CCTLD and running an internet cafe for the island. And the really interesting presentation is still there on the PacNord website, which is basically Rue's explanation of what was going on and a plea for assistance from the community. So back then, 2009, the network was 384 kilobits per second satellite link to Telstra. Yep, 384 kilobits. It's not a misprint. That's what they had. Windows NT server, not a misprint either. That's what it was. Um, Windows NT, what's that? Back to 1999, 2000. Running firewall and an internet gateway. There was a Cisco 1005 router to Newbridge 2601 satellite modem. There was a CCTLD registry. Uh, some of you probably know Frank Martin now at LinkedIn. He wrote that software way, way back and it's still in uh, service. Um, and it provided a website, simple pop email servers, and also ran the primary DNS for the island. And there was another system that did all the anti-span, antivirus, and handled SMTP plus the secondary DNS. And there were two Cisco 2509s. Um, for those of you who have been around as long as me, look those up. Those, again, last century um, routers um, that were used as access servers with dial-up modems. So, Really from Rue's visit to Fiji, um, I was at Cisco then and I got involved in trying to modernize the ISP such that by the end of uh, March 2014, um, those are basically nine megabits of satellite capacity using Pactel uh, from Australia to Nauru. Um, we modernized the routers, so 2811 in Sydney, two 3745s on Ireland. Custom aggregation was done by Wi-Fi and by Ethernet. The dial-up had gone because a couple of years after um, 2009, the actual telecom was shut down when the last technician retired and could no longer maintain the copper um, wires. And so that's when Digicel was invited in to operate a mobile network. And so now there's no uh, copper infrastructure on Nauru um, at all. Um, so it's local peering with Digicel Nauru because, you know, back then, as it is now, keeping local traffic local is very, very important. Uh, and that made sure that this uh, happened. We're a dual stack network, so V4 and V6. So getting V6 deployed way back then was uh, quite an achievement. And then we had three homemade servers. Basically, I went down to the local computer store here in Brisbane, um, bought three PCs, kind of built them myself, um, shipped them over there, and then we... Um, built them together into a Ganetti cluster, so a virtualization cluster uh, using Ganetti. Um, Phil Renault from NSRC came along with me on this particular trip to virtualize uh, NR Web DNS1. So we got rid of the creaky old, I think it probably would have been early 2000 hardware still, I think it was 386 of a member processor, um, meg of RAM, something tiny like that, I don't remember. And we built another VM running all the 
you know, the usual public domain uh, open source monitoring tools. Um, so Phil and I went there in July 2012. Um, so that was when the photos, we spent a good week there, ate lots and lots of tuna sashimi, the best tuna sashimi in the world can be had in Nauru because it's caught in the early morning and you sit down for breakfast and eat tuna sashimi, highly recommend it. Um, so we ate a lot of that and we did a lot of work in actually building the infrastructure there. From April 2014 to 2019, the government changed. Um, SANPAC was operated by different entities, mostly focusing on CCTLD. All the customers, by and large, were moved over to Digicel Nauru for the connectivity instead. And the satellite capacity was moved from Pactel to a Hong Kong company called ACC Lynx. And they also built a domestic Wi-Fi backbone. Um, Following the next change of government in tw uh, late 2019, so late last year, uh, Rue came back. And so the reconstruction and modernization of SENPAC started. Now, what I don't have time to do is go through absolutely everything here, but you know, these are some of the fascinating things that we're to try and deal with. So we'll start with the biggest one first, which is the satellite, because you know this is a story I've seen so many places, so many times. Um, all around the world, where we have to do things in most unexpected circumstances. So on the 11th of October last year, ACC Links was ordered to cease operations on Nauru by the government. And so that was the first panic email pretty much I got from Rue, who was saying, um, ACC Links are going to be shut down, we need to find something else. So he spent a month chasing around um, other satellite operators trying to find alternative capacity. The quickest and easiest option was to well, requisition, resume the Pactel link, which was now being used by the local bank branch, only by the local bank and by nobody else. And that was the quickest one that we could get in place uh, before ACC links actually quit Nauru altogether. Um, a lot of story behind that, won't go into it. Basically they had a site visit on 18th of December. I mean, that's, that's a couple of months um, after the initial a cease order to modify the existing bank connection so it could also support SENPAC. ACC withdrew their bandwidth slowly and surely, like this. Um, so you can see now this is the end of November. So mid-November, they had throttled SENPAC back to about 13 meg down and 4 meg up. And then last week of December, it went down to 4. And you see, you see the classic tabletop on any monitoring system. So this is Observium, classic tabletop. And then it was reduced again and then suddenly on Friday 29th of November, it was turned off completely. That's not a bug in Observium, that's turned off. Um, so that was a bit of a panic. Uh, Rue had to go back and beg for service to be restored and it was granted at 128 kilobits per second. Now 128 kilobits per second are the sort of things that we were connecting customers in the UK in 1993, and that was the premium internet access for some of Pipex customers. <laughs> of course, we don't have 1993 levels of traffic. We now have all the things like Facebook and websites and, and so forth, not, not even mention YouTube. So only option with this um, teeny, teeny capacity was basically move all the other customers away onto Digicel and so it could actually log into the routers to try and reconfigure, pardon me, reconfigure them for the new Speedcast link. So technician arrived on site on the 18th, Friday 20th, ACC was shut off completely. And this is still why the Speedcast technician was redoing all the satellite connection, um, changing various components and so forth. There was a lot of work that had to be done on site. So of course, .nr goes offline. Now you think, oh, you know, CCOD, blah, blah, blah. But the thing is the Nauru government sits under .nr, so they went off site, so nothing resolved. Once DNS time to live timed out, gone. And so it was huge panic to try and get back online. Um, how do we get access to the routers? Because it seemed like a kind of chicken and egg problem. We couldn't come over um, ACC link because they're gone. We couldn't get over Speedcast link because it wasn't plugged into anything. Um, we couldn't get access to the routers to do all that. So the way we actually ended up doing it was taking Rudolph's laptop, plugging it into the um, satellite modem. He configured the IP address that I used. Thank goodness I begged and begged Speedcast to give us a public IP address for the point-to-point -point link. 
and we got SSH into the laptop that way through the office Wi-Fi into the router. Luckily, I'd left the office Wi-Fi being able to access the infrastructure. And we got everything changed. Um, and then the router connected and the link worked. So that was a huge relief. And of course, that was just the link working. And then the next day, we were doing this on Friday night. On the Saturday, Speedcast finally brought up the BGP session. But even though they're told the upstream providers, hey, you customer, open your filters. These are the prefixes. They were told on Saturday, oh, but Telstra Vocus Optus, who are the upstreams, only update filters every 24 hours. Now, this is Saturday. Another thing I discovered, of course, ACC links was still originating the Sendpack address space and hadn't stopped announcing it. So everything was being black holed. So Room managed to get them to stop. There was still one um, member of staff of AC Links on Ireland. So he managed to get the uh, announcement of the Sendpack address space stopped. And it only was on Monday that Telstra finally updated the filter. So, so much for every 24 update, two days later. But the other two providers, Vocus and Optus, there were still no filter updates and still not until, um, I think it was three or four days later, if I remember rightly. So notice the dates, that's 23rd of December. You think, yeah, we've got internet back. Happy Christmas, everyone. Nope, it wasn't. Very unhappy Christmas for Nauru last year. 7 a.m. Tuesday the 24th, internet stopped. And it came back at 11 a.m. Friday the 27th. So. I think maybe somebody somewhere was deciding Nauruans are going to really have to enjoy Christmas and not sit on YouTube and watch videos or whatever else they were doing. Um, actually, it didn't turn out to be that. The diagnosis was that the buck, which is this device that connects to the, between the satellite modem and the dish, had failed. A new one was put on the next flight to Nauru. Um, but then the few, few days later, the link came back. Um, so it wasn't the buck. And well, there's a speedcast. Um, network engineer saying, oh, um, we managed to just do a reset on the link and well, it all came back and it's all been working great. In fact, the buck turned up several months later. So I have no idea where the freight forwarder had actually hidden it for the interim time. Lesson from this is pretty obvious. Cutting one connection for the other one is commission isn't really the best idea. Um, but then the government had decided these people are not going to be uh, present in country anymore find something else to do and you have a month to do it. I mean, easy said, but pretty hard to do. And that caused major stress, especially with the CCTLD being out twice because that impacted so many um, organizations, including the government. But at least, you know, we had access to the equipment. We could have come through Digicel's uh, mobile network, we think, um, but thankfully we had a, a public address on the Speedcast point-to-point -point link we could get in that way. And so you think, yes, now everything is just fine. But actually, all that Speedcast engineer ha had time to do before his flight back to Australia was add in a connectivity for Sendpack. And the way he did it was start at the bank office and run an Ethernet cable through a couple of walls, then the same building, through a couple of walls and plug into a Sendpack switch. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll be, I'll be back in the new year and, new year and we'll tidy all this up. Well, that was all fine and good. I um, mean, it was an urgent trip and it was a short one just to get things running. But the new year became February, then March, and we all know what happened in March. Um, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus uh, struck in late March. And here in Australia, all Australians and permanent residents were banned from traveling overseas. So the dog leg stayed. And, there have been lots of discussions and proposals and so forth about how to remove the dog leg because being a bank, if I just jump back to the slide, bank doesn't really want to go offline. You know, it's got ATMs connected there. They've got to pay salaries and everything else. So they can't really go offline. And how to do this with remote hands and keep everything online and the fact that we couldn't go there and you know, many numbers make light work, um, we just never got anywhere. In the end, um, we got a new modem. Speedcast shipped a new modem in mid-November. This is only two weeks ago, actually. Um, this new modem had multiple Ethernet ports. So one port could be used for the bank. The other one could be used for Sendpack. So after 11 months of being a complete risk about what the bank power is doing or what they do with equipment rack or whatever, um, Sendpack is now 
reliably connected through the Speedcast link. Sandpack had a UPS and generator. The bank probably just had a small UPS for its critical equipment rather than being available 24 by 7. Anyway, so the dog leg has finally gone. That was always a topic of discussion between Rue and me for, I don't know, 11 months, every week or every two weeks would end up trying to work out what to do about this. And of course, you know, redundancy is very important. Um, satellites, you know, can be subject to what the sun gets up to or the angle between the dish and the, and the actual satellite itself. So very important to get a second provider. And so AVCOM was contracted to provide um, a second link for Sendpack. They're based in Sydney. Um, so the original plan was to basically, the dish would be shipped in pieces along with BAC and modem and all the other stuff to Nauru. So that went ahead just fine. And then the AVCOM staff would come and install everything and hand over a working service. And you know, that's perfectly reasoned. They said, delicate job, only they can do it. Of course, with, um, COVID-19 and all the shutdowns here. Well, the shutdowns meant freight flights were canceled, staff were working at home, warehouses had minimal staffing. So even the shipment of all the equipment ended up being delayed. And we were running into you know, late April, early May, and there was still the only the single speed cast link and subject to, well, all the issues that satellite connections can have. So in the end, AVCOM agreed to allow Sendpack team to build the dish themselves. So this was work done in late May and all through June, following instructions provided by AVCOM. The only thing is not everything fitted exactly. If you look at that picture very, very closely, you'll see that the top left of the dish there doesn't actually quite line up. And if you look at the top right, it doesn't quite line up either. In fact, there was a lot of improvisations to be done to make it work. Now, were the panels all different shaped or were they panels from different dishes? Nobody will ever know. But this kind of misalignment gave rise to issues that we didn't really quite understand in the coming months. Um, after the link was being provisioned, there was a weak signal. So maybe it was the dish that was wrong or maybe it was the buck that was wrong. But anyway, aside from that, it was important to get the link working. So BGP was running upstream filters are opened up, much less hassle than we had with the Speedcast link. Here's a picture of the installation as it was back in, uh, this was yeah, early June time, uh, just to show you the, the typical installation. But then something seemed not quite right. We're running through early July and it's like, this was meant to be a 62 by 34. So 62 download, 34 upload link. Yet we weren't getting anywhere near that. And you know, customers were complaining about things being slow and you know, Rue trying to do downloads and so on, it seemed to be really slow. Um, as I'll come to later, you can't use speed tests. So we, um, I set up iPerf, used iPerf 3. I tried initially uh, to a US host because I had ready access to do that. And the best I could get was just short of 33 megabits per second down and 20 megabits per second up. So that's well short of what uh, was actually being paid for. So on to AVCOM and trying to find what it all was. Um, so a lot of tuning had to be done, a lot of discussion with Intelsat, uh, which was IS-18 satellite, um, and also brought up a second channel, a uh, second transponder, which gave more download capacity because that was now possible. And so after doing all that, we got up to about 47 down and 20, still about the same 20 up, but that's still well short of what was being sold. And really it was the weakness of the signal. The modem in Nauru was saying the signal was very, very weak. And then well, likewise um, in Sydney, it was a very weak signal on that C-band connection. Um, you know, the speculation that the US host wasn't the best place. So I tried it on Australia host and I tried it on an Asia host that I got access to and it was exactly the same results. So we knew there was something up with the link. In fact, so much so AVCOM recommended that we move the whole infrastructure over to KU band on IS1R, which is another Intel sat um, dish, but running in the K sorry, satellite, but in the KU band. Plus a new buck, realigned the dish. And there's a huge difference, as you can see here in October, um, when I did the performance testing after the new link was handed over. This is running to spec, 90.7 megabits per second real throughput. Uh, which, you know, for a theoretical 96, if you look at all the overheads and everything else, I think this is pretty reasonable. And it's much, much closer to what uh, Sandpack were expecting to get uh, back in, well, 
back in January when they bought it and back in June when it finally was commissioned. So today we're happy. Uh, SEMPAC is redundant satellite links from two providers. Um, BGP we'll talk about in a few minutes, tweaking the timers, independent satellites, upstream operators have different transit providers, Speedcast lands in Perth, Avcom ran, lands in Sydney, both of them are at Equinix Sydney, so we can actually see them there as well. And it's about as good as we can get right now. Uh, in fact, the nice thing is the .NR CCTLD has not been offline since 27th of December last year. So that's really where we want to be. So there are a lot more stories about the satellite, but I think that's a higher level idea to give you some of the things that we had to deal with. Um, the next one, let's have a look at BGP. Uh, or just the routing in general. So the core is a fairly standard um, point of presence uh, design. So redundant core, duplicate everything, duplicate border routers, duplicate cores. We've got switches doing various aggregation. Uh, we've got the cluster uh, managing servers. We've got out of band. Of course, we've got the corporate network as well. So it's a simple but uh, solid core network. So for eBGP, well, I got public IP addresses on the satellite links. The idea being if they're using private addresses and BGP breaks, we have no way of getting access to the routers. Whereas we've got public address space, I'll be able to log in here from Brisbane and fix anything that um, might have broken should it have broken in Nauru. Um, both upstreams are accepting the uh, V4 slash 19 aggregate that I mentioned at the start. And we also just send slash 20 sub prefixes kind of for really for traffic engineering future purposes. And also for testing, I've come except three other specific as well. Um, and of course, the link from a border router to the satellite equipment is by Ethernet. So we can't rely on a physical interface going down to fail over the BGP session. So what I've done is tweak the BGP timers way, way down. 10 second keep alive, 30 second hold time. The nice thing is if a remote peer disappears, there's an issue with the satellite link, the BGP session is torn down and fails over. Um, now it's about 60 seconds rather than the five minutes if we use Cisco defaults. Wouldn't it be great if we had BFD on a satellite mo uh, modem? BFD is bi-directional forwarding detection for those of you who not, don't know. So it's basically a um, layer two way of uh, device figuring out if the remote has disappeared or not. Much, much more effective than just waiting for BGP timers to run out. Any BGP tricks? Not really. Um, I've left the Cisco default distances, which goes counter to all my recommendations and all my BGP workshops and tutorials. But here we actually need them because what I want to be able to do is that each border router's best path is out its own satellite link. I don't want one border router to best path through the other one, just in case the other link is somehow not functioning properly. So maybe the other link's advertising a default, but it's not reachable. So we have make sure the defaults go out the same border router. And I back it up with a static default out the satellite link with a 254 distance just to make it um, in case BGP vanishes completely. And you know, it has done. And when it does, it means I can still log in to the routers on the public IP address on the one side. And then I use ISIS to propagate the default route um, through the well network now as it is, but this will be growing in future, I'm sure. For ISIS, just the usual good practices. I don't think there's anything unusual here. Just doing the default information originate with that route map, which basically looks for the default uh, appearing in the Cisco's global rib and then announces it in the um, ISIS as well. And this is how I do it. I mean, it's documented elsewhere, but we use it to good effect here. And it means, for example, if one of the links goes down, we lose the default, we're flicking over to the other one basically almost don't even notice the, the flick over, which is which is very good place to be. Um, as for load balancing, this is a work in progress. It's a moving target, as all of you who are involved in BGP know. Uh, what works one day will have to be changed the next day. And I'm in the middle of working uh, through changes uh, for SendPack because the Equinix exchange in Sydney changed something on the right server a few days ago and has changed the traffic balance between Speedcast and Avcom. So we'll still have to try and figure that one out. Um, so for inbound traffic, we basically announced the aggregate and um, two slash 20s. Right now, not really needed, but I'm thinking with the work that I have to do in the coming days, we're going to have to load balance between the two 20s. 
Uh, for outbound traffic, we only get a default from Speedcast because they can't deliver the full table. Um, whereas for Avcom, they can send and we're taking the full table, but throwing away all the routes that have um, AS paths more than five hops long. So it's about 50% gets thrown away. And this seems to work pretty nicely um, at the moment, but as traffic grows on the network, um, it will need some work. Those of you who are watching carefully, especially the IPv6 folks, will have noticed there is no v6 mention, apart from right at the start. When we deployed it in 2010, but today, Avcom, Avcom cannot provide. Speedcast cannot provide. So what do we do? The local network is dual stack, but I've had to remove the quad A addresses, so the v6 addresses, from uh, the DNS, and actually from the public servers as well, because some of them will try and use v6 if they've got a v6 address configured. And so I'm left do I really have to get a GRE tunnel to somewhere? I mean, this is what we're doing in the 90s and early 2000s. Do we still tunnel v6? But it's incredible that Avcom and Speedcast simply cannot provide. Um, moving swiftly on, manners. I'm sure you have heard of the mutually agreed norms for routing security, and I'm making sure Sendpack is doing its bit. Um, raw signing is still to be done. The hoops to be jumped through, mostly on the administrative side but we're doing route origin validation. So we're using route, um, route on ATA 3000 from NLNet Labs, but of course there's a default route. So it's kind of token because anything that's invalid just goes out the default anyway. Um, but you know, at least the thought is there. We've got URPF, you know, you've heard of the BCP38, you know, the anti-spoofing filter that's on every interface. And yep, there is a lot of interesting, what I call stuff coming from customers. Um, peering DB still needs to be done as well. So, you know, we're, we're trying to do our bit, but um, certainly as many best practices as I can implement for uh, Sendpack. For IBGP, it's very simple, nothing amazing here. So I'll move on to the next one, which is much more interesting. Careful what you leak. Now, I've mentioned this quite a few times over recent years in a lot of the BGP workshops and best practices that I've been doing because it's very fashionable for network operators to, to spray 24s around, especially in Asia, at random, hey, we're doing traffic engineering. Well, no, you're not. Scattergun, just spraying things around at random is not traffic engineering. And I've always said it totally wrecks the customer service quality. And of course, when I was doing performance testing of the satellite links, guess what? I found very slow BGP convergence and withdrawn prefixes being held onto by some operators for more than 30 minutes, just completely backhauling traffic. So here's the experiment I did. Um, whoops, one too far. What I was trying to do was performance testing. So trying to do performance testing on the Avcom link. So I'd leak a slash 22 to let the testing run on there. Um, so fine, I do that. I stopped the announcement of the 240 covering slash 20. And what should happen is the 240 would just disappear over the next two, three minutes from the whole internet. Um, well, so that you only see the best path through Speedcast. Um, that didn't happen. And also, it should mean that all traffic enters via the Avcom link, and I could do all my tests. Well, this is where it was. So I do a trace route from sitting here at home in Brisbane to um, basically the 255.1 address, which is part of that uh, slash 22 I was leaking. That's what it should be. When I withdraw the slash 20, nothing should have changed. But it did. I have no idea how it changed. Avcom didn't change any of the announcements, but it changed. Why did it change? And look at the path. It goes Brisbane, Sydney, Hong Kong, Singapore, Perth, Sydney, Nauru. Now, you know, we can list off all these cities and, you know, the nice places to visit and so forth, but look at the round trip times. It's amazing hops. Um, you know, Sydney to Hong Kong is 140 milliseconds. And then Sydney to Hong Kong to then on to Singapore and Paris, you see the round trip times escalating like crazy there. And eventually we end up with 640 uh, milliseconds round trip time from here in Brisbane to Nauru because we do the scenic path um, all the way through Southeast Asia. No idea, never found an answer. And then the next thing, this is after 15 minutes, after 15 minutes of withdrawing the 240 slash 20 from AFCOM, they should have gone from the path. But Avcom's AS is 138988. I should only be seeing the one higher up in the list. 
via 5666, which is Speedcast. But after 15 minutes, the paths that go through AS7545 are still there. What are they doing? That's a rhetorical question. If you're wondering who a 7545 is, look them up. I don't know what they're doing. I'd love to know what they're doing. Um, 20 minutes later, finally, um, things are changing. So at, after 20 minutes, I finished my testing and then I withdrew the slash 22. Now you'd think it would take normal kind of propagation or maybe five to 10 minutes to disappear from the internet. So I withdraw it and you, you expect the routing kind of to go a little bit weird. And it does, it goes Brisbane, Sydney, Hong Kong, Singapore, Perth, Sydney, Sydney, San Jose, San Francisco, Portland, Sydney, Sydney, San Jose. So, you know, a kind of world tour, well, it's almost a world tour. It's going to uh, West Coast US, um, it's ending up in Hong Kong and Singapore. It's probably half the world that's taking a wander around. A couple of minutes later, oh, we've got stuck somewhere in Zayo's network, um, West Coast US. And then another minute later, oh, let's go over to the East Coast of the US just for good measure. Um, so eventually, um, after four minutes of doing this withdrawal, it's almost completely disappeared. This is RouteFuse hosted at the University of Oregon. So this is actually the Oregon one. Um, but I looked at several other route views, and the only paths remaining for this slash 22 were everything that transited AS174. You can look them up. I don't know what they're doing. Why is it still there? Especially when it's been withdrawn. And the problem is, because this prefix is basically being black holed um, in AS174's network, I had no access to that slash 22, um, which was a big, big problem. Um, now, here we go. Um, so this is back to the one that I withdrew uh, 30 minutes ago. So we still see the AS7545 clinging on to that announcement for dear life. This is after 30 minutes and it's still visible in route views in many different route views. Again, this is the Oregon one, but I went to London and Paris and so forth. And I looked in those route views and sure enough, the path through 7545 was still there. 35 minutes, so this was 15 minutes um, after I withdrew 23982.52.0. I can get access to it again. Okay, thankfully it was a second interface on the router, so I didn't cut myself off, but I finally got access. So 15 minutes, so just a simple withdrawal cuts me off from slash 22 of address space uh, for 15 minutes. Is BGP really this slow? Answers on a postcard. In fact, um, if I look at route views, I still see that path hung on to by dear life by AS174. Does AS174 use BGP or do they use something else? Because I have no idea what this looks like. Static routes that are looked after by um, you know, a technical team or something, because this should, just should not be happening. Anyway, after 40 minutes, I got back to the status quo. And this was happy day. So it's 40 minutes of pretty much routing chaos just by withdrawing a slash 20, announcing a slash 22, withdrawing the 22, and re-announcing the slash 20. Um, that's really not good. So I've got to be very mindful what I'm doing when I design future traffic engineering solution for SendPath. I cannot leak a sub-prefix on a single path. Absolutely cannot do that because it's going to take 15 or even 30 minutes for the backup to give connectivity. So now I understand why earlier in the year, some of the customers were complaining about the internet's been cut off for, for 15 or 20 minutes. I wasn't seeing it because of just my vantage point here in Brisbane, but it was certainly affecting a lot of other parts of the internet. Oh, and just to finish the routing section, how about this? I do a trace route from the border route. This is a couple of days ago, and it goes through that uh, brand new Speedcast modem. And this new tech modem you do a trace route to destination, I was going to NSRC in the US and the modem itself says, oh, I'm NSRC, I will reply. Uh, why? How did this even get out the door? New tech, what are you doing? And same for the other direction coming from me going all the way to Nauru. It just responds as, oh, I'm, I'll pretend to be the destination when it's not. Anyway, on to the next thing. Um, this is the Wi-Fi network. Um, I think I only really have time to go through this before we um, call it a day. And I want to jump to the observations because there's, there's just so many stories here. But let's have a look at the Wi-Fi network. Um, 
just quickly, um, Sandpipe purchased the ACC Lynx Wi-Fi network. So they didn't t tear it all down when they left the country. They left it, Sandpipe bought it. And so all oh, ubiquity, power beam and air fibers, but all the management addresses were private address space. And so how do I get access from um, Brisbane? You know, Rudolph said, hey, Philip, can we just take this over and can you reconfigure it, please? Um, that was a simple network, not much of anything at all. The only issue is how do you get access to private address space from three and a half thousand kilometers away? Well, the solution is SSH proxy via the jump host um, and then piping VLANs through to a router announcing the private address space by BGP so it actually can get from the jump host through to the management interfaces of the Ubiquiti APs. Now, fairly easily said, it took a little bit more to do. And have you tried this over 550 millisecond round trip time link recently? Ubiquiti expect you to manage their Wi-Fi access points from, well, sitting right next to them, not half a second away. And so often, and it drove me completely mad, was you're in the middle of doing something and then the AP would said, oh, I haven't heard from you for whatever, and it timed out and prevent, presented me with a login screen again. Um, also, my network at home is on 192.168.1 address. Oh, how do I get access to 192.168.1.20, which is ubiquity default over, a, over a, an SSH proxy? Well, rather than reconfiguring my whole home network, I just jumped onto my home Wi-Fi, which is a different subnet, because I've got lots of subnets here, and I could get in that way. And then, you know, the amazing thing is, I had to do software updates. Nothing had been touched by ACC links. The kit had come out of the box with exactly the software it was running um, when it left the factory. And, you know, the security advisories against all the kit was just, well, was scary. Those of you who know Ubiquity know exactly what I'm talking about. And of course, doing the upgrades, and then you discover after you try an upgrade that you can't just go all the way to the newest because actually they're not compatible with each other for whatever reason. Um, this was the air fiber especially. So you've got to find an interim one and, and so forth. Upgrading the remote um, is better to do that first than the local because you upgrade a local, then you can't get access to remote. What the only way out is to download and oh, read the re release notes first. Other interesting things, country was set to Russia. I don't know why, I mean, Russia is certainly not Nauru. I set it to Australia because Nauru uses a lot of Australian kit and same power plugs and um, voltage and so forth. The channel choices, a lot of them were just left to uh, ubiquity, just pick what you like. Um, and what we had is documentation to actually match reality. Uh, the channel widths didn't even match. Um, and it was actually one of Senpak's staff uh, mentioned that, oh, but if you try this channel, it might work. And sure, sorry, this bandwidth, channel width, then it would actually work. You find out the APs won't associate if there's a channel width mismatch. And you do, you do all the usual good stuff. And so we got there, things work. Um, and here's an example, looks good. And then I discovered the main trunk. So this civic center is really where Senpak HQ is. Command Ridge is the highest hill on Nauru. Uh, where everything fans out from. But for some reason, ACC links had set this up as half duplex. This is on an air fiber um, and 10 megahertz channel width. And that gave 65 megabits per second. And look at the jitter you can see on the smoke ping graph. So I then had to, again, sitting here, adjust all that to try and make it a little bit better. Of course, they used the last channel possible in the five gigahertz spectrum. So if you want to make the width wider, you've got to change the actual channel used. And if you want to run full duplex, you've got one channel transmit, the other one um, to transmit in the other direction. So it was a bit of hopping about to do. First, you have to go duplex, then 20 megahertz, then 40. But look what it does. It's so clean now. And so now we get 200 megabits per second. That's even with badly misaligned, as, as those of you, again, who know ubiquity, these are misaligned. So that's work that needs to be done. We should be getting about 350 or 400 megabits per second out of this, but this is way better than it used to be. Um, oh, another thing, of course, a lot of the Wi-Fi that had been put out, the Ubiquiti Nano stations just had the username password changed, channels left on auto. Other people in Nauru can set up access points as well. So the whole thing was to bring it under management control, fix the AP channels used, and then monitor it a lot so we can do the site survey on the APs and find out 
what else is going on. So I think what I want to do, I mean, there's a lot more to talk about, but we're running out of time. So what I'll do is just to finish off, I'll jump all the way through to uh, the observations. Um, I mean, the, the speed test one was fascinating. That's another story about, you know, customers whining that, ooh, you're not getting the bandwidth, you know, speed test says. So we actually have set up a speed test node on Nauru itself. So now the speed test is as fast as the local infrastructure can, bright, can provide. But, you know, just some of the observations to finish off. Um, procuring equipment during the pandemic, um, if it's not available locally in country, in other words, for me in Australia, it may as well not exist. And so during the April, June lockdown, interstate was taking two to three weeks. Um, just with, and as I mentioned right at the start, you know, reduced staffing in warehouses, reduced staffing in suppliers, can't, you know, shipments can't happen. Most things are by road freight here, and it's just not happening. International shipments, I was getting quotes for three or more months in mid-year. Uh, now the quotes are a bit better. In fact, memory for the uh, servers we were upgrading took three months to come from the US. It was just incredible. I don't know why or where it got lost because it was ex expedited mail and everything, but anyway, three months. Shipping equipment, everything has slowed down. Freight forwarders have reduced staffing. They've all got social distancing. They're doing temperature checks for staff coming in and out, hand sanitizer everywhere and so on. I think all of you are, uh, know that well, but everything has really got slow. And we find, you know, airway bill details, proof of shipping, confirmed flights, and so forth. And that's been very, very challenging over the last six months. This one's very important. This originally was the first slide. Never assume anything. I think I've learned, I mean, I've been doing this for more than 30 years, but I've learned never assume anything. And also learned something else in communication. Avoid lengthy emails to explain a task. Now, since I've done con started doing contract work for NSLC, um, you know, a lot of the NSSC staff are gifted and they do these amazing explanations, detailed, you know, everything is in place. And I've been trying to improve my own standards of explaining things. And, you know, when you get an answer saying, well, that's a very nice email, but I don't understand it, please explain what you're trying to do. <laughs> so it's diagrams and photos. Draw diagrams, take pictures of things. Ask for pictures of things. They're worth thousands of words. They save huge amounts of frustration, misunderstanding, and so forth. Rue and I have exchanged so many diagrams and pictures and so on. So customer installations, everything, all are photos. Another thing that it kind of, well, all network engineers and network operators know, documentation, yeah, we'll, we'll do that tomorrow. You know, we're tired after the maintenance. I've learned, now do your documentation as you do it. Update monitoring systems, because you get the email next morning saying, hey, Philip, um, looks like the satellite link is down. It's like, well, no, we actually changed the IP address. So do the documentation to shave stress and pain. Language, explain work required in clear and plain language. Especially don't use jargon. Don't assume that your jargon is known by others because jargon is different in different parts of the world. And a lot of us who've been doing this for a long, long time know all the jargon very, very well. But a lot of people who are newer to it don't know the jargon. And, you know, not everybody's going to sit in Google just to try and work out what your jargon means. And same with remote hands. And, you know, many colleagues have mentioned this in recent weeks to me as well when I've been talking about doing this presentation. When asking colleagues and clients to do work, don't assume they have your own or your regular remote hands skill set. It's much better. Get on a, your favorite video tool, WhatsApp or whatever you're using. Get on a video call. See it with your own eyes because it saves email, voice calls, messaging, and all the other pain. Um, and also planning. Much more detailed planning is needed. How to stay connected when doing major transmission transitions. You know, my plan way back, you know, after Apricot had completed in February in Melbourne was to get in a plane, pop over to Nauru for a week or a couple, help Ru get everything set up and so forth. And that was Avcom's idea as well with getting the satellite link set up. But um, fate intervened, COVID-19 stopped all that. And well, unfortunately, there's still no sight about when we're actually going to be able to travel overseas from Australia. Um, so those are some of the observations. I probably have a few more. Um, there's a lot of um, stories and so on I haven't covered, but I'm pretty sure the slides will be available on the Lynx website for you to go and have a look at some of the other stories. Hope you enjoyed it, hope it was useful. 
And if there are any questions, I'll be very happy to take those um, now, once I can find out how to stop the screen share. Thank you so much, Philip. Okay. That was a fascinating talk. Uh, and uh, you managed to squeeze in a lot in that short space of time. And I'm sure there's a lot more uh, that you have to say about it. Um, so anyone participating remotely now is your chance. Please make sure to ask any questions you have in the Q&A. Um, just that I'll start out with, with a few questions. I thought it was interesting because I think there were a few lessons learned there. Um, I mean, that could be applied just generally, really to anyone building a network or, uh, and then of course, a few that are quite specific to this um, strange situation we, we're all in. Um, and I know this is, this might be a difficult question, but if you could have gone back and done anything differently, is there anything that stands out or anything that you can think of that, that would have made your life a lot easier? Um, I, I think, you know, realizing that um, thousands of words aren't really helpful. Um, I mean, one thing also with, with email, um, you know, Rue and I now, we will write one email on one subject, rather than trying to write a great big long email and cover seven different subjects, because, you know, all kind of rushing, we're all looking at different things. Um, it doesn't work. So having one subject, one discussion, lots of diagrams, lots of photos. I mean, I've gotten to that habit now. And so any question coming from Sandpack is now, okay, here's a diagram. In fact, the question coming is, Philip, please do a diagram. <laughs> Um, but, you know, you know, this sort of thing, and, you know, I think we reached that point in about July, August time, uh, you know, Rue and I just had a, had, had a conversation on WhatsApp. It's like, okay, so emails aren't really working in, in that type of long detailed level, which, you know, some people might appreciate because, you know, in a lot of the workshops I've done and people come asking afterwards, they want the great big long explanation because they'll go away and they'll study it and figure it out and so on because, that they're interested in that. But when you have to deliver something and the customer wants to connect tomorrow, trying to decipher a long technical email, no, give me a picture, show me where the IP addresses go, show me what plugs in where and, and get it done. So, you know, that, that's what I would have done um, right from the start and would have probably mm. saved a lot of the heartache. Mm. No, well, I, I know also from my previous job when we were making installations all around the globe and sometimes we would get someone else to install it for us we always said take a picture of it front to back and then at least you have something documented and it's quite easy to then um yeah to understand the setup so i think that's a that's a very good tip um and then i guess a broader question um i know you know some of the the problems that you're describing is is also the problems that have to do with the fact that it's a pacific island there's very limited connectivity. They're dependent on a satellite light link. I know that there's quite a few interesting developments happening um, in the Pacific and there are new submarine cables being laid down. Do you have anything, is there, do you think there'll be, um, do you have any interesting infrastructure development changes uh, that you see coming that might, you know, improve the, the connectivity in, in that region? Um, well, I mean, the, I mean, I, I think some of the people on here will know that, you know, there are a lot of new submarine fiber across in the Pacific. I mean, the Pacific Islands are getting better and better connected. And I think really by, what was it, 2022, there'll be very few left that have no connections whatsoever. And I know that, you know, Sandpak or the Nauru government have been looking at the possibility of getting fiber running from Nauru up to Federated States of Micronesia to join the, the, ca the cable there. But, you know, fiber costs a lot of money. And mm. um, so until that can come to fruition or there's funding to try and support that, you know, we'll have to make the best we can with, with the satellites. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of developments on the satellites as well. You know, everybody sees, you know, Starlink, uh, Elon Musk, you know, getting a lot of headlines, but a lot of other developments on the satellite, you know, whether it's mid Earth orbit or even some of the low Earth orbit. So that might help because it's the mm. latency that's a killer for a lot of this. Um, mm. You know, it's around trip time, so you can have as much bandwidth as you want. But I was pointing out, you know, in the, in the speed test bit, you know, speed test is only running over like 30 seconds. It's not enough 
to open the window wide enough to actually do throughput. And so a user trying to do a simple download doesn't understand that it's going to take a while to do this over a satellite link, even if you throw 100 megabits per second at it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's still uh, quite a few uh, Pacific nations, islands that are going to have to work with what satellite has on offer. Um, they're not going to be lucky to get submarine fiber. A lot of the places you can't just run fiber to every single island. For example, look at Kiribati. You know, how many islands make up Kiribati? But, you know, when they do get fiber, it'll only go to Tarawa. And how can it go to all the other places as well? So um, it's going to be with us for quite a while. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a good question from Mark Pryor. Are you concerned that both satellites land in Australia? Yes. Yep, I am. And, you know, Sandpack is as well. But, you know, this is really what could be got at the, you know, they were given basically for the month of October to fix this. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was the only ones they could uh, get on board fast enough uh, for the ACC Link's withdrawal. Of course, you know, ACC Link's being a Hong Kong company, it actually landed in Hong Kong. And so there are options to go back to like Singapore, or Hong Kong or Hawaii for landing. And that would be much better because I'm, I mean, I said as good as it can get with the current setup, I'm really bothered that it all goes through Sydney. And, you know, Mark knows as well as I do, having Sydney as a whopping single point of failure in Australia is really, really bad. You know, it has to be distributed much more than it is, but that's an issue that, you know, the Australian providers are going to have to deal with. All the fiber should not be landing in Sydney. It needs to be coming uh, many other places. At least Speedcast land in Perth, and, you know, they are, they are at uh, the exchange point there. If they can get transit to Southeast Asia out through Perth, I'd be even happier. And I think they're working on something like that. Um, but ultimately for Senpak, um, landing somewhere else in region, Southeast Asia or Hawaii would be kind of where I'd want to look at next um, mm -hmm. rather than having two providers in Australia. All right, yeah. Well, interesting, uh, interesting stuff indeed. And I think, uh, unfortunately, we've already come to the full hour but uh, I'll give people a last chance to throw any questions in the Q&A. And while you do so, I might add that uh, we're also um, running a podcast series, uh, the Linkscast, that my talented colleagues in the communications department are doing. And um, we might do a little interview with Philip, because I know that there are a lot of other questions um, that I'm sure people have. And uh, I was going to suggest that if people have questions or think of questions afterwards, feel free to either pop them in the chat or the Q&A here or send them to marketing at links.net and we'll try to follow up with Philip. I know he's very much in demand. So uh, if we can make the time, we'll try to do that as a way of um, digging a little bit deeper into uh, Philip's presentation. I just see a lot of comments in the chat saying that it's a great presentation. Um, I think with that, I'll give you the chance to say a few closing words if you have any, Philip. Um, I personally found it very fascinating, um, but feel free to share any final comments. No, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm reading the comments as well. You know, it's, it's nice to see a lot of familiar names there. And you know, I'm glad that uh, folks um, on the webinar have enjoyed it. And I hope that the people who watch it on YouTube uh, later on will uh, you know, enjoy it as well. But also, you know, feel free to reach out to me just you know, for more detail. Um, I can forward you to, to Rue and he can talk to you about some of the challenges he's facing as well. Um, but you know, otherwise, you know, it's, it's been, you know, a really interesting time. It's taken quite a bit of my time this year, but in some sense, you know, we, we've been trapped here, well, initially trapped in Queensland, but now trapped in Australia. It's, it's been, you know, well, it's not what I expected when we started off 2020, put it that way, but it's, it's certainly been interesting to try and rebuild, um, um, you know, a provider like this. And this is the sort of thing I really enjoy doing, you know, these small operators and getting them up to using industry standards and so forth and what's all, feasible with relatively inexpensive equipment and so forth. Indeed, yeah, thank you. Um, so with that, I might actually also add, because of, as we were talking in preparation of this uh, talk, there is, I might also point people to the PACNOG 
uh, community, which is the Pacific uh, Network Operators Group. Uh, I think it's PACDOC.org. And I think you mentioned that you are actually meeting next week. Um, so if people are interested in what's happening in the Pacific, that is the place to go to. And uh, Philip uh, does a lot of work there, as you know, and there are others from the region that um, share things during the events, but also the mailing list. And yes, uh, with, yeah, yeah I was going ahead. to say, yes, PAC, PACNOG is Tuesday next week. The conference is all online because sadly we cannot meet in person in the Cook Islands because we cannot travel. So it'll be online and, you know, we'll welcome the international community to participate. So 1st of December, um, Asia time. Fantastic. Okay, well, thank you indeed for that very interesting presentation, Philip. I'd like to thank all of you who are participating live. I've seen uh, participants from Afghanistan, from Bhutan, from, uh, I believe, Solomon Islands, from uh, Malaysia, from the Philippines, from Mongolia. I think uh, all these participants is actually a testament to your work, Philip, because they're probably all people who you have helped throughout the year. So thank you all of you who participated live. And of course, all of you watch it afterwards. So please do keep an eye out on the LINCS website for upcoming presentations and tutorials. We have some really interesting speakers coming up and we've also had some fantastic presentations. So go and have a look on the LINCS YouTube channel and on the LINCS website to check some of those out. And with that, I'd like to again give a special thanks to Philip for taking the time to share this very interesting presentation. It's been a real pleasure listening to your talk as always. So um, when we can't see each other in person, at least this is, uh, this doesn't make up for it, but uh, it provides uh, a lot of, it provides something. And I think the information that you've uh, provided has been very valuable. So with that, I'd like to say thanks to everyone. Be well, stay healthy and safe, and hope to see you all very soon again. Thank you. <laughs>